October in Haifa and I'm with Phil Lydell who is uh, working in Israel uh, evangelizing here in Israel and uh, Phil if you can just tell us uh, uh, about yourself please well I um, grew up in Missouri rural Missouri south of Kansas City um, I went to school to university in Boston where I met my wife my wife Heidi uh, she studied uh, architecture, I studied engineering. We were married just after she finished college She's, uh, and um, we went out and worked for a while in uh, order to pay back some school loans. In about 1985 we felt called to full-time ministry and we began ministering with an organization in the United States called Campus Crusade for Christ working on university campus in the New England area. I uh, grew up with a real heart for Israel and, uh, and uh, we had a, an interest in going overseas and the Lord put in our hearts a desire to go and in 1989, uh, March 4th of 1989, we arrived here in Israel to live. We had our first son, Josiah, who was born uh, in 1987 in New Hampshire and uh, then in 1988, about a year and a half later, our second child Abigail was born when we so we arrived here we had two small children uh, I came with the first goal of studying began to study at the Technion uh, received ooh, we might have to okay. take a break here yeah we'll take a break um, we had we arrived here to study at the Technion the Israel Institute of Technology um, and to be involved in campus ministry at the universities here in Haifa. We uh, spent the first couple of years primarily just working on learning the Hebrew language and uh, also adding to our family. Uh, 1989 my daughter Hannah was born here in Haifa and then in 1991 we had our uh, fourth child and our second son Elishua and in 92 our youngest son Noah was born. So we have five children that the Lord gave to us. Our goal in, in coming here uh, was to be light and soul to the people of Israel. And uh, in doing that, we felt it was pretty important to be a, a part of that culture. So the kids, as they got old enough, began going to these preschools to learn Hebrew and began going to the Hebrew school system. And uh, we began to learn more and more about Israeli culture, Jewish culture, about how Israelis celebrate holidays, what holidays they celebrate, um, connecting with people in the various opportunities that we would have, both through my studies at the Technion, through relationships with other families. Um, when I think about our, our time here in Israel, the Lord's really blessed that time through giving us lots of relationships. Um, people here, I would say, are very friendly. They're different from the United States uh, and their values, their systems are not what what you would expect if you try to look at it from your own cultural perspective. But that was part of the challenge, to learn uh, how to view things here. And over the years, we feel like we've really become part. The children all are uh, very fluent in Hebrew. Uh, I've become very fluent in Hebrew and can function very well. And Heidi has many friends and functions very fluently as well. And so, um, for us at least, Israel's become home. Uh, 1995, when I finished my, my degree, we were back in the United States for a while. And it was really interesting to see how much we had become Israelis. Okay, cool. Yeah. Now who's calling? This is somebody with a private... The part of the challenge has been to get to know people and to connect with them, and we feel like we've done a, a really good job of being able to do that, or maybe I should say the Lord's really blessed us in giving us lots of opportunities. You know, the children and going to school, being involved in, in the things that they have done, the things that they... Um, would be called upon to do, whether it be class trips, or whether it be special celebrations or birthday parties, is a natural opportunity to connect with people. And our kids have 
not only each personally receive the Lord as their Savior, but they have developed a desire to be salt and light to their friends. I think particularly when I think of Abigail, um, I think of someone who was especially burdened and especially concerned about her friends. Um, our daughter Abigail uh, was in the eighth grade. Uh, she had a group of girls that she had uh, invested in. One's named Malam. Malam is a Druze girl who uh, on the first day of class in a Jewish uh, grade school uh, feeling kind of lost was approached by Abigail and asked if she'd want to eat her lunch together. And that was typical I think of Abigail's approach to find somebody new to reach out to befriend them and of course Malam became a close friend. I could think of a couple of the other girls that she was close to. Uh, Salit, who came to the school again as new in uh, sixth grade, and uh, wanted to always bother Abigail, was the way you could put it. Uh, she kind of wanted to punch and beat, you know, to get attention. And I guess finally one day Abigail, who had studied judo, just went ahead and put her flat on her back and said, that's enough of this, let's be friends and let's stop this business. And Salit became a very, very close friend. Uh, this group of girls that, that Abigail knew and met with were a group of girls who, like many girls, have problems. They, they like to talk about one another. They like to get brogas, as we say in Hebrew, a little bit upset with one another. And so she was always concerned about how her friends could relate properly to one another. Uh, this, this past year, here uh, in March, uh, Abigail was scheduled to come home from school uh, at class ended at 2 o'clock. She was going to actually either come by home or just go on to a special lesson. And she got on board a number 37 bus in Central Carmel. And uh, the bus never made it home. She, the bus, you may know this story or heard, have heard the story of the 37 bus that was blown up by a suicide bomber. And that was obviously a very difficult day for us. I'll remember uh, probably forever hearing that a bus had been blown up and turning on the TV and wondering uh, what's true because the initial reports have a lot of different conflicting information. But as the picture became very clear that it was a 37 bus that was coming from the Central Carmel, as, it, as the time became very clear, as the location became very clear, um, and as we failed to hear from our daughter Abigail, uh, we began to become very concerned that she had been on that bus. And as time proved, she had indeed been on the bus and uh, was killed by the blast. When you think about when you think about and you go through losing someone you love, um, that that's obviously a very difficult thing, and uh, we've had to deal with with that over the last months. There are a lot of tears. And there's a lot of, of hurt. There's a lot of times when you are sitting as a family and you really miss the one you love right there. And yet for us, as we've been in this process, we've seen how the Lord has worked. Uh, during the initial, initial time, right after Abigail died, the Lord kept bringing me back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, where he talks about, uh, or Paul really talks about the fact that God the, is one who is the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. And he talks about that comfort and about why and how God gives that comfort. And uh, I've been really impressed that God's purpose in giving that comfort is for His glory. And as you work through 2 Corinthians in chapter 4, Paul is, is talking about how we, as clay vessels, uh, pots, if you will, that are not particularly glorious or particularly strong, are filled with His glory, with His power, so that the power and the greatness may be to Him, that the glory would be His and not for us. And I think as he opens that passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, he's talking about how God in the midst of, of trial, in the midst of grieving, in the midst of difficult circumstances, wants to give us supernatural power so that he's seen and not us. And I really think that that's 
that's what God's done for us in this process. As I think about Israel, of course, a lot of people would ask the question, well, why do you want to be in Israel, and why are you crazy enough to stay there? Uh, in fact, I, we were home this summer in the United States sharing with people, and I had some relatives kind of ask that question, you're going back? Uh, as if that were the craziest thing they ever heard in their life, or that we would never consider going and for us home. And I know that my youngest son, Noah, spending time with his cousins and some of his uh, more distant relatives was having a great time. He really enjoyed that. What does he like about America? They're cousins in America, he'd say. But what was he looking forward to? He was looking forward to going home because he has his friends here in Israel. And Israel is home. And I think that's true for, for our family because the Lord's called us to make this our home. And um, the Lord has given a lot of good things as a result. Now why he would choose to take Abigail home, uh, I can't answer that question. I know that I've asked that question, and I know that he hasn't decided to give me the answer. But I do know he's brought glory to himself. And I think that's really what counts in this life. Um, my daughter Abigail was at an age where she really wanted to make her life count for the Lord. We, two weeks after the bombing went to the police to pick up her things and there weren't a lot she had her knapsack with her books and uh, a coat it had been colder that morning and she brought a coat with her but it had actually been warm enough going home that she had it on her lap and so as we went to the police station and got the got the things and brought them home and opened the bag we we had some idea of what was she carrying with her and there weren't, weren't a lot of things one of the things in there was a book. Uh, she'd been reading some books by a man named Frank Peretti. And she'd been reading uh, his second book about spiritual warfare, uh, Piercing This Darkness. Spiritual warfare was something that had been on her mind. It was on her heart. She was considering, you know, what would the Lord want her to do? She'd uh, been quite an artist. Her pictures and her portfolio demonstrate just the talent and the gift that the Lord had given her there. And in her, her uh, calendar, she had, at the very beginning, drawn a picture that she pasted in that shows an angel and a, and a demon who were in, if you will, a spiritual battle over the life of this one young girl who was going in a door. And she'd written to the side, how can they live life without purpose? But God has a purpose for everyone. Those were the things that as an 8th grader were on our heart and were on our mind. I would say that probably the, the most poignant thing that I found in her diary was the words to a song. It was a couple weeks later before we realized uh, where she'd gotten these words. But she'd listened to a song by a man named Chris Rice, and it was the only thing like this that she'd written into her diary. Uh, she'd taken and while listening to the song or thinking about the song, had written these words down to remind herself. The song is called The Power of a Moment. And it asks the question, what am I going to be when I grow up? What are they going to write about me when I die? She, it goes on to talk about how these are the questions that really matter. And how the, the thing that, that is important is the moment. And it's a prayer to, that that God would teach us the importance of the power of a moment. As I think about Abigail, I think about her life, I can see that he had chosen to glorify himself. He's chosen to cause some people, some people, to see the truth about who he is, about the greatness of, of his power in, in people's lives, and about the difference he can make. Beyond that, I can't, I can't say why. I can only say that it's difficult to lose someone you love. But I, I also know that death is something all of us are going to face. Uh, only if we're very privileged to be here when the Lord returns do we have any, any hope of not each of us, 100% of us, having to deal with the loss of someone we love and of our own death. And I know that what really counts is not the things that we see here. And again, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, towards the end of that chapter, what does Paul talk about? Not when we look at the things that are, are seen, but 
as we look at the things that are unseen. Because the things that are, are, are seen are temporal, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And that our focus is not on what happens here and now, but on what is going on for eternity. What is God doing for the rest of, of not this world, but the rest of all time imaginable? And how is he working in people's lives? And so that the time that we have now is only just a small fraction. It's just a few moments, if you will, in light of eternity. And how are we going to live in light of eternity? And I think that more than anything, that's the thing that keeps us here. Because we know that he's called us. He's called us to, to be here now. And that he has the perfect power to protect us, no matter where we can be. And he also has the ability to call us home anytime he wants. And so there's no, there's nothing that we can effectively do to make a difference. But the safest place for us to be is in the center as well, in obeying him and doing what he wants us to do. The terror, and I, and I could talk to you about the situation here in Israel, terror here is, is obviously a horrible thing. Uh, just today we have the news of a, of a horrible attack that occurred yesterday where a, a woman walked into a restaurant and blew herself up and has killed at least 19 people. And when you hear those kind of things, and as we looked at the television yesterday, I mean, it brings back to you again afresh the, the tension, the, the wondering, is our loved one the one there? And while there's a certain amount of, of security knowing that we're all here, we're all accounted for, there's still an understanding of the horror of people who, who seek to kill other people to find a solution to the problems that exist in this world. And we know that the real solution of those problems are only found through, through Jesus Christ, through Yeshua Mashiach, the one who God has appointed to be the ruler of this world, to come and to judge the King of Kings. He's the only one who can solve problems. And why is that? Well, it's because the basic problem isn't who owns what piece of land. Uh, the basic problem is who owns people's hearts. And are people really going to bow the knee of their heart to the one who wants to give them love, joy, and peace, who wants to make their life meaningful and purposeful? And we're in the middle of a battle. We're in the middle of, of a spiritual battle that has physical consequences. And so we're committed to staying here and being a, the, a part of that battle as God's called us to be a part. And we, we simply pray that he, in his power, would make a dramatic impact here in the nation of Israel, in the lives of his people. That they would turn to know the one who is called to be their Messiah, the one appointed by God. And that we would see him uh, quickly bring it in. And we do pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. So... I could probably ask answer questions if you want to add more to all that. David, would you want to ask any questions? If I want. I just let that run and Yeah. Well, I think that's just, I'm so humbled by that. Just humbled by you. I think it was important to get a believer. Yeah. You know, because I don't think you'll get to speak to any other believers. Praise the Lord, there hasn't been too many that have been touched by this, but I thought it was just important to get a perspective from a believer that it's yeah. perfect material. Mm. You know, the other people